So let's invite Patty Gravit. My pleasure to have her here to talk about HPV and HIV. And soon we'll have her presentation here. Yes. Thank you very much, Patty. Great. Thank you, Louisa. Um, just forward it backwards on me. What do you, okay. Um, my pleasure to be here to talk about uh, the co-infections between HPV and HIV, um, focusing particularly on acute and chronic effects of HIV infection on the natural history of cervical HPV infection, but at the end give a little bit about a reciprocal role of, that HPV infections may have on HIV acquisition risk. Here are my disclosures. So I'm just going to briefly talk about what we really know for over two decades about um, the clinical effects um, of HIV on HPV infection. So we know that HIV-infected individuals have a higher prevalence and incidence of HPV infection and their associated lesions. We also know that HIV-infected uh, individuals clear those infections and lesions less efficiently. And, here, and that happens both in the male and female genital tracts. We see it in the anal canal and the oral cavity of both men and women. And here are just some of the seminal studies which um, demonstrated these uh, data. But because this session was, was actually titled HPV Natural History Biological Perspective, what I thought I would do is to try to bring together some of the biology that you've just heard about with some of the epidemiologic data and show you that in fact a lot of what you've just heard this morning is quite consistent with the uh, epidemiology and the natural history studies, even though it may not be immediately intuitive that it, it is so. Because biologically, HIV infection has been a rather unfortunate natural experiment, but it has provided insight into the role of the immune system on the control of genital HPV infection, and I hope to convey some of that to you in the next few slides. Um, that's important because we don't really have good model systems um, to evaluate directly the interaction between HIV and HPV, and so we need to look within the epidemiologic literature and the observational studies to see if we can gain some important insights. This is just a recapitulation of the natural history model that you saw this morning um, presented by Susanna Kier. And what I'll just say in here is that um, HIV basically is driving that natural history pathway towards progression towards the right and decreasing the likelihood that that natural history is going to go back towards the regressive pathway and to the left. And we've seen that in, in tons of epidemiologic studies. This is just an example from the WISE cohort in North America um, to, to demonstrate uh, that data, that HIV increases both HPV prevalence and HPV incidence, and that it decreases clearance of infection. And I think the decrease in clearance, we all understand HPV is immunosuppressive, and therefore you would expect more persistent viral infection. What I'd like to focus on is why do we see such a profound increase in HPV incidence in an HIV-infected individual compared to an uninfected individual? And many of you may say, well, you know, come on, that's obvious. It's um, essentially just shared sexual risk. Those women who are acquiring HIV, of course, are also likely to acquire HPV through the same sexual transmission modes. But I think it's really, really critical to look back at some of the details of these studies, and in particular, to think about the fact that this, actu this study, this cohort study, the WISE study, enrolled HIV-infected women and a risk match set of HIV-uninfected women. So our HIV-uninfected controls here, when we look at their relative sexual behaviors compared to the HIV-infected, you can see in the top graph they're reporting very similar numbers of lifetime sexual partners. And in the bottom graph, a very similar number of recent new sex partners, and if anything, the HIV-infected women having slightly lower risk of new sexual partners that you would think would contribute to incident infection. So if they're not having any more likelihood of sexual exposures, then what's explaining this really profound increase in HPV incidence here? Well, the same study did a really remarkably and I think seminal analysis from this study. And they compared new HPV detection, or what we have typically called incident HPV, um, in two groups. One who reported some sexual activity during the past 18 months before we started counting new infections, but the other group who re reported that they remained sexually absent, no sexual activity or exposures at all in the 18 months preceding the beginning of the counting of the incident infection. And what you can see is that new HPV detection, or again, what we typically call incidents, 
is observed in the sexually ab abstinent women at a non-trivial rate, right? It's, it's relatively lower than the sexually active women, but it's still um, quite remarkable. And this suggests that if they're having no opportunity of new exposures, that potentially what we're seeing here is reactivation of latent infection, um, such as what you've um, heard from the other speakers this morning. So that's epidemiologic evidence that support that model. The other thing that's important to note is that in both groups, the rate of new HPV detection actually increases with, increases, with increasing level of in, immune suppression. And that's suggesting that those CD4 positive T cells that are most affected by HIV um, infection must be very important naturally in controlling this latent HPV infection. And so we already know multiple parts of the natural history pathway where HIV is likely to have an impact, but I'd just like to add another potential part of the pathway, which is the latent HPV state, and ask the question, do we think that HIV is actually having an impact in controlling latent undetectable, the transition between latent undetectable infection and detectable HPV reactivation? So you've already heard from John Dorbar this morning the ROPV model of papillomavirus latency. And I'd just like to say that, you know, if we think about that model of latency, one would expect that since the epithelium, if we're retaining latent infection here in the basal epithelial layer, and the epithelium is constantly regenerating, wouldn't you expect to see um, in population studies just a constant HPV detection under this model? And as Margaret just told you, it looks like that what's really important in the control of these infections is a local immune response. And I would just like to bring up in the next few slides the possible role of tissue resident effector memory cells and some epidemiologic evidence to support that these resident T cells are actually very important in the control of these um, latent infections. Now this is actually data and a, and a figure from the gut mucosa, but these things have been shown just equally as well in the genital tract and particularly have been shown very well to be important in controlling um, HSV2 reactivation. But essentially you've seen um, in, in John, John's uh, animation that you, after an acute infection, you get antigen presentation in the draining lymph nodes after the Langerhans cells or dendritic cells have picked up the HPV antigen and migrated, activate the T cells, which then are are homed back to the site of the original infection. But what's been very recently described in, in every epithelial surface is that it appears that once these cells come back, some are, are, are activated, some become central memory cells and go back to the circulation, but many of them actually um, express certain surface markers such as CD103, which is the uh, uh, alpha-7 to beta-7 um, integrin molecule, and that that actually interacts with the epithelium and retains those antigen-specific effector memory cells at the site of the original infection. Now, why is that important in HIV? Well, it's important because we know that these tissue residents, CCR5 positive T cells, are actually massively depleted within days of HIV acquisition. And just to remind you of the natural history of HIV, and in particular, you can see that if you look in the peripheral blood CD4 count that you, and in blue, you can see there's an immediate drop um, during the acute phase of HIV infection in CD4 count, but it rebounds relatively nicely um, after that initial drop and stays reasonably high and detectable through most of the chronic infection and still, until the CD4 starts to decline just prior to the onset of AIDS. I want you to contrast that, though, to what I'm gonna show you happens in the mucosal CD4 compartment. And in this compartment, what you see is that when you get acute infection, you get almost complete decimation of the memory CD4 population at the mucosal surface. And importantly, that population does not appear to reconstitute um, sufficiently as you would see in the peripheral blood. And so we essentially asked the question, well, under the model that we've described to you about papillomavirus latency in the basal epithelium, um, is it possible if those tissue resident memory cells that I just described to you are controlling that latent infection, wouldn't we predict that if we lost those after acute infection, we'd see an immediate increase then in the reactivation of HPV? And we actually had an opportunity to look directly uh, and test that hypothesis. So we did a case control study in Zimbabwe with our colleagues Charlie Morrison and Nancy Patey and David Chalantano, where we um, selected, we had a study 
where we selected 154 HIV seroconverters and we matched them to 478 women who remained seronegative but were under same um, observational follow-up and matched them by age and presence of other sexually transmitted infections. And we detected HPV DNA by Roche Linear Array for 37 different types at this index visit and at two visits three and six months prior to HIV acquisition when both groups were HIV uninfected. And also, two and th or three and six months after HIV seroconversion in the cases where we have the differential um, HIV exposure. And those are T plus one and T plus two. And what you can see from our results is that if you look at the T minus one visit, there was no significant increased risk among women who would ultimately seroconvert to HIV in the the risk of multiple new type detections at a time when those women remained HIV uninfected compared to the women who remained HIV uninfected throughout the entire study. But even at the first HIV positive visit, so this is within another three months time period maximally, you see a, a fourfold increased risk in multiple new type detections. And that risk in the, in the HIV seroconverters and that risk is retained for another six months um, that we had money to actually study in the follow-up. And so I think with these data, I just like to propose a bit of a revised model of papillomavirus latency. I think that these results suggest that it's possible that these tissue resident CCR5 T cells are critical for long-term control of latent infection, that virtual obliteration of these resident memory T cells within the first days of HIV acquisition leads to an immediate increase in HPV re reactivation. And what this also says is that it's probably, that might explain why we don't see this reactivation in the normal situation, that these, these cells are controlling, you know, if you're having regeneration of the epithelium and maybe short bursts of reactivation and replication, these cells are bringing that back under control such that the duration would be so short that you wouldn't see it in a typical natural history design. Now, I'm going to switch gears a little bit because in the HIV world, there's become a lot of interest, and I don't know if all of us uh, follow it, but a lot of interest in some recent studies which have shown that HPV-infected women are actually at an increased risk of HIV acquisition. And there's a, I'll just point to a, a nice uh, meta-analysis that summarizes these studies. And so what I want to bring up, is it possible that this model that we're talking about of tissue resident T cell control of latent HPV infection, could that help to explain these observations? So just to summarize from our study, you can see that we can measure or, or categorize HPV in a number of ways, any HPV, any high risk, any low risk HPV. And if you look at the far right hand corner, the um, strength of the association or the odds ratio associated with HIV acquisition is very similar in magnitude to that of very well-known associations with other sexually transmitted infections, including herpes virus and HIV acquisition. So it does seem that we are seeing a, a positive association between HPV infection and HIV acquisition. We see that as a dose response. So the more HPV genotypes that were present, the higher the risk of HIV acquisition. And importantly, what we see is that it may be that it's the activated cells that are really driving the risk. Because if we looked at, compared to H HPV negative women, women that were observed to clear or to go from DNA positive to DNA negative for an HPV type during the window just before we detected HIV were at a significantly higher risk of HIV acquisition. And there was almost no risk associated with HPV infections, which all of which persisted throughout that time frame, which suggests that there may be some activation specific marker that's increasing the um, T cell pool and, and increasing HIV risk. And so in summary, it, it, it appears that HPV reactivation may stimulate the activation and expansion of tissue resident memory T cells. And when that happens, it increases the pool of HIV susceptible target cells. I'll just end with kind of a, a note on whether, because a, a lot of people in the HIV field have become very excited about the possibility that HPV vaccination could impact and have a, a, a major impact on HIV infection risk. And I would just add, like to add a little bit of caution in getting too excited about this. Um, one is that we haven't really seen collectively strong evidence for type specificity of the association. And I'd just like to point out that the Gardasil, for example, will, will get rid of four out of 
probably 50 or more HPV infections that may be controlled latently in the genital tract. And so just getting rid of those four out of that number, it's not clear to me how that may have a, a tremendous um, impact on HIV risk. And it's also likely that it's a total latent infection pool, but even beyond HPV, that's important in mediating this risk and getting rid of HPV and leaving HSV2, et cetera, may not, again, have a very marked um, impact. So randomized trials have been suggested to evaluate this, and I would just say that I question the ability to adequately power these studies, even if there is some minimal risk of infection, because to tease out all of these other competing risks with other HPV co-infections and other STI co-infections may be very, very difficult. And observational studies in HPV vaccinated cohorts might be better to provide empirical evidence that a vaccinated cohort would result in reduced HIV incidence um, and, again, wouldn't deprive any woman of the beneficial effects of HPV vaccination reserving reducing cervical cancer risk. So just in summary, I think that the epidemiologic evidence um, in the HIV context is more consistent with an increased reactivation of HPV and in HIV infected individuals rather really than an increased susceptibility to new infection. These data are consistent with the model of tissue resident T cell control of HPV reactivation and may also explain some of the other observations we've seen in the HIV infected cohorts, such as the relative ineffectiveness of heart on reducing HPV infection, because we also know that heart doesn't really reconstitute the, the mucosal CD4 populations to the same extent that it does the peripheral blood concentrations. It may also explain the high recurrence rate of HPV and SIL even after treatment and the observed increased risk of HIV acquisition that I just described. And I think I'll just reiterate in the end what Margaret had said is that it's likely that really what we're looking at is very local responses. And so further elaboration of the immune response against HPV and the control of latent infection um, are, is probably going to require looking in the tissue and looking locally. And with that, I thank you very much for your attention.